As you see, the title of this has nothing to do with finite model theory on the face of it. So perhaps the first question I should try to answer is, uh, what does logic and relational databases uh, has to do with finite model theory? And I think the best answer I can give you is to quote from my colleague and friend, Victor Vianu, who in a paper in 1997 uh, said that in a very real sense, Finite model theory provides the backbone of database theory. And databases provide a concrete scenario for finite model theory. So what I want to do uh, in these two lectures today and tomorrow is to give you a sense as to why this is true. And there will be uh, nothing new in, for the most part of it, except perhaps if we have time uh, tomorrow. So for the past uh, 40 years, there has been a very extensive and very productive interaction uh, between logic and databases. Uh, logic provides a unifying framework uh, and also a, a set of tools and methods for studying tasks that have to do with data management. Uh, actually, for me, uh, the interaction between logic and databases goes two ways. In one sense, it is a prime example of logic in computer science. But uh, as I hope we will see probably mostly tomorrow if we have time, it's also an example, a very nice example of logic arising from computer science. Here is what I'd like to do. Uh, the first part is uh, really textbook material, just packaged in a way that you may not have necessarily seen before. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, relational algebra and relational calculus. This goes back to the work of Ted Codd from 40 years ago. Then I want to look at a subclass, a very special fragment of first order logic called conjunctive queries, and uh, study their properties and their connections with homomorphisms. I, I understand this will be also a theme in Ben Rossman's uh, presentation tomorrow. And from there, we, we've talked a lot about the limitations of uh, first order logic, we will see how these limitations are overcome in the context of database theory by way of a language called data log, which is a fragment of least fixed point logic. Time permitting tomorrow, I hope we'll get into some more recent applications of this interaction of logic and databases, namely foundations and applications of schema mapping. Uh, what, does, what do these topics have together? The glue that holds them together, the unifying theme, is the interplay between databases, logic, and computational complexity. How did it all get started? Uh, we owe it to this man, uh, Edgar Code, or Ted Code, as he was known to his colleagues and friends. And in some sense, the history of databases is a history of scientific and technological revolution. Uh, what Code did, uh, was to start the scientific revolution 40 years ago uh, at the IBM San Jose lab, which is now called the IBM uh, Almaden Research Center. Uh, he did two things. One was to introduce the relational data model, and at the same time introduce two languages for asking queries against databases, relational calculus and relational algebra. That was the scientific revolution very quickly within the next decade, we had the technological revolution with the development of system R at IBM, ingress at uh, Berkeley, and very soon uh, the Oracle Corporation getting to the picture with the product and IBM following with DB2, and the rest is history. Today, relational database technology is a 17, 18 billion dollar industry uh, a year. So let me briefly remind you of what Ted Co did. Uh, he formalized the relational data model by saying that relations, namely subsets of Cartesian products, are a good uh, formal object for representing data. And the idea he had in mind, of course, was that we can think of a table as a way of storing records, and a table formally 
uh, is really a subset of a Cartesian product uh, of sets, that is to say, a relation in the sense that we've been seeing here today. And then he introduced the notions of relational schema and relational database schema, and this is nothing else but what today it was called the vocabulary in the first talks in the morning. Uh, in other words, we have relation symbols. They have specified identities, but the only difference here is that we give names to the various positions of the, uh, in its, in its uh, relation symbol, and we call them attributes. So we can think of a relation schema as being a set of attributes or a symbol with a fixed identity. And therefore, this is a template, a blueprint, uh, that represents relations of that particular identity, but also with names of the attributes. And then an instance of a relation schema is simply a relation that conforms to the schema. In an actual database management system, you have to have some matching data types, but I will suppress this uh, for now. And then a relational database schema is a collection of such relational schemas. And the database or a database instance uh, is simply a collection of relations that conform uh, with the schemas that we have. So you may ask now, what is the difference between what we've been seeing all morning and databases, I think I can summarize the difference in this slide. Uh, a relational structure, as we saw before, is an object that has a universe that we have made explicit in the bunch of relations. A database is basically a relational structure in which the universe has not been made explicit. We only have the relations. That's an important difference which we will very soon see it's going to cause us some problems. But Code had the idea that these are dynamic objects. New, new elements may come into the picture and populate the relations, so the universe may change. So he only made explicit the relations, not the universe. So that's the only difference in some sense between relational structures and databases as we saw them uh, today. So as I said uh, in a few slides ago, uh, code introduced two languages for asking queries against databases. The first is a procedural language. And procedural here means we tell the sequence of operations, we specify a sequence of operations by which, by the execution of which, will give us the answer to the question we ask against the database. The other one was declarative. Uh, in other words, we use some high-level language, in this case first-order logic, to specify what we want to retrieve as opposed to how to retrieve it. And code proved a theorem that in some sense relational algebra and relational calculus have the same expressive power. This is not exactly true, and I want to explain in what sense it's not exactly true and in what sense it is true. Okay, so that's what I'd like to, to formalize. It's really textbook material. We just need to make it precise. Let me remind you uh, what code did by way of relational algebra. Basically, relational algebra is the set of expressions that you uh, obtain by starting with a bunch of relations in your schema, in your vocabulary, whatever you want to call it, and closing them under these five operations. The first three operations are perfectly general from discrete mathematics, union, difference, that's set theoretic difference. He, he just in, insisted that these are relations of the same identity, Cartesian product. And then he had, he had two special operations that are special because they are meaningful for uh, relations. The first was projection, and the second was selection. So what is projection? Intuitively, projection is the operation by which you want to suppress or hide some of the columns in your table. So for instance, uh, if we have a table with banking information, accounts, uh, banking accounts, and we want to uh, suppress uh, the information about the account number and the balance, then we, we, basically, uh, and we basically get, uh, if we only want to keep the customer name and the branch name, that's, that's what we get. Formally speaking, the syntax of the projection is uh, this, pi for projection, i1, im, where i1, im are distinct integers from 1 up to k. And the semantics is it gives you back 
the set of all m tuples such that there is a completion of this m tuple to a k tuple coming from your original relation. So this not only suppresses some columns, but also allows, allows for rearrangement of the columns, changing the order. So this is an operation on columns uh, of the table. He, uh, Code had also the idea that we need, and rightly so, we need another operation that filters some rows, throws out some rows. And that's the selection operator. So the selection, again, is a sequence of operators, of, of operations, one for every condition. The condition is a Boolean test to which we subject every row. If it passes the test, we keep it in the result. Otherwise, we throw it out. And then the question is, what are we allowed in the condition? Well, in, in a language like SQL, the conditions are very elaborate. But in the case of uh, code, the conditions were very simple. Uh, he allowed equality, equal, not equal, and if you have a a total order in the domain uh, of, some at of the values of some attributes, then you allow arithmetic comparisons bigger than, less than or equal than, and then you take the Boolean closure uh, of these expressions. So you can talk about people who, uh, whose balance in the checking account is more than 10,000, or who live in this locality and the balance is less than 9,000, and so on and so forth. By the way, please feel to interrupt me as we go along. This has been a very We've been very, very attentive, but also a very quiet audience. So. so now here is the formal syntax that relational algebra is a string obtained from the basic relations by applying these uh, operations. So that's the first language that code gave. Notice that each of these operations is very simple, but the strength of these operations comes uh, when you combine them together. And then Code went on in his second paper to give some non-trivial examples of new operations that you could derive from these basic operations. And uh, perhaps uh, the most basic and important operation is the natural join. Is, is everyone familiar here with natural join? Yes? Who, who is not? <laughs> All right. So let's quickly explain what a natural join is. Uh, here is a motivating example. Let's say we have in a university the registrar's database that inf has information about a uh, faculty who teach a course in a particular term and information about enrollment, students, course, and term, right? Because that's what happens. The department an announces the teaching schedule, the students enroll in courses, right? And then, of course, we get in the beginning of the term a list that has the name of the students enrolled in the course. So how is this done? Well, we want to obtain the taught by student, course, term, and faculty name. And uh, it will turn out that this is the natural join, which is given by this bow tie symbol between these two relations. So formally, the definition of the natural join is the following. Uh, suppose you have two relation schemas. R and S, and suppose that they have some attributes in common. Remember, these the positions are named, right? So suppose they share some uh, names, as we saw before, the two relations were sharing names. Then the projection, the, the, excuse me, the natural join is a projection of a selection of the Cartesian product. Okay, so here is how it's carried out. You start with the Cartesian product of two relations, and then you keep the tuples in this Cartesian product that have the property that for every common attributes, the value in the first relation is the same as the value in the second relation. Now you get a subset of the Cartesian product where you have a lot of duplications. For each duplicate, you keep one of the two. And that's the natural join. So indeed, uh, if you do in, in the previous exam, uh, you get the taught by from teachers and enrolls. And there is, of course, a very naive algorithm that uh, basically creates the Cartesian product for every, for every tuple you see whether or not they match. Notice that in the case where the two relations have no attributes in common, then the natural join becomes the Cartesian product, right? So in principle, it's as expensive to compute as the Cartesian product. 
Here is a second example, also goes back to, to code. And this is a more complicated operation called the quotient or the division. So what is the quotient or the division? You have two relations, R and S, but now you're going to assume that the RIT of R is bigger than the RIT of S. And then the quotient is a relation whose RIT is the difference of the RITs, R minus S. And it consists of all the tuples of length R minus S such that no matter what tuple you get from S, when you append the two tuples, you end up in R. Now you this, way, this sounds very strange, but it does something very useful. Uh, let's look at an example to appreciate it. Victor Viano happens to be a great instructor at UC San Diego. And you want to find the students who have taken every course that Victor Viano has taught. Okay, how will you compute this if you only had relational algebra? Well, it's very simple. From teacher's faculty name and course, we can obtain the courses taught by Victor Viano, right? That's easy. That's a projection of the selection uh, teachers who are in the selection condition who use faculty name equal Victor Viano. Now we have a table with only one column that gives the course of Victor Viano. Now we want the students who have taken every course that Victor Viano has taken. So if you follow the definition, this is nothing else but the quotient of enrolls divided by the courses taken by Victor Viano. Now when you look at this, at the definition of the quotient, it's not obvious right away that this is expressible in relational algebra. Yet it is, and that's a non-trivial exercise for undergraduate students. Uh, let me illustrate how this is done by doing it concretely for a relation of RIT5 and the relation of RIT2. Therefore, the quotient is going to have RIT3. And the idea here is that we got to use the difference operator. Okay, we remember before in the example of the natural join, we saw we've used projection, we use selection, we use Cartesian product. The union, you can imagine situations that you can use the union. But here is a way to use the difference. And it goes like this. The quotient basically is a subset of the projection of 1, 2, 3 of R, right? Because it consists of all the triples such that no matter what pair you append from S, you end up in R, right? So what we have to do is, intuitively speaking, take the projection 1, 2, 3 of R and throw away the tuples in the projection that don't make it into R minus S. In other words, the projection is our candidates, and we want to throw all the ones that don't make it, all the failed candidates, so to speak. Now, let's consider this relational algebra expression. This is the Cartesian product of 1 to pi 1 to 3 with s, take away r. These are really the things that don't make it to r minus s. So therefore, to get the quotient, what we need to do is take the difference again. So this we have a nested use of the difference. And this way we get the quotient uh, as a, an expression in relational algebra. Okay. So uh, as I said, this goes back, back to code. He illustrated that you can do interesting things uh, with these operations. Now, there is a sort of basic language design question. Uh, code came up with these five operations, and I showed you how you can express interesting other operations. Do you need all of these operations or not? This is, uh, in other words, was there any redundancy in his language? Uh, code was a very precise man. I never had the honor to meet him, but that's what I hear from the people that knew him. And he was very careful. You, you actually can prove that none of these five operators can be expressed in terms of the other four. So this is the theorem. Each of the five relational algebra operations is independent of the other four. 
you cannot find an algebra expression that involves the four of them and gives you the fifth one. And how do you prove something like this? Well, this is like a lower bound in expressive power. The idea here is to find a property for each operation that the operation has, but no expression built from the other four has it. So let me ask, how would you do the Cartesian product? It's very easy. What does the Cartesian product do to the arities? It increases the arities, right? The other four operations, whether it's projection or union or difference, right, or selection, well, projection lowers it, union keeps it the same, difference keeps it the same, selection keeps it the same, right? So you find one property that the four have and the fifth doesn't have, and I told you what to do with the with the projection, with the Cartesian product, it increases the arity. The projection decreases the arity. Okay. What will you do with the difference? Well, it goes back to some of the discussions we had in the morning here. The other four operations are monotone. If you put more in the arguments, you don't lose any tuples. The difference, in general, has the property that if you put more in the second argument of the difference, R minus S, you may decrease the outcome, right? So this monotonicity property is what tells them apart. It's trickier to do it for the union. It's an interesting uh, exercise. So the bottom line is that Code chose his five operations very, very carefully, right? There was no redundancy. There is no fudge. It's a very lean, lean language. Okay, that's all I want to say about the algebra. Uh, this had direct effect on, what's that? Yes, yes, but it's, but it's, it's not as easy to see. <laughs> that's a non-trivial exercise. I mean, yes, yes, yes. No, no, it's just combinatorial. It's very, it's combina it's to find the right combinatorial property. There is no, I'm, I'm sure there is a proof I lost, but it's just a straight combinatorial argument. It is true because, I mean, the theorem is true that I said it before, right? <laughs> it's part of the five basic operations, right? Okay. And uh, you can see here the direct influence on the design on the, of SQL and the semantics of SQL. SQL, the main construct, is select from where? And unfortunately, select corresponds to projection. <laughs> where corresponds to selection and from the Cartesian product, right? So uh, you would... To express the projection of the selection of the Cartesian product in SQL, you would write that select this R1, A1, R A M, A M from these relations from this Cartesian product where this condition is satisfied. So direct influence of relational algebra on the design of, uh, of SQL. Now, in addition, code introduced relational calculus. And uh, relational calculus is a declarative uh, language which is entirely based on first order logic. There are two versions of calculus. Uh, actually, uh, Code introduced the tuple calculus in which first order citizens variables were ranging over uh, tuples of a fixed arity, of arity k. So this is like making arrays first class citizens as opposed to making elements of arrays. Uh, here in logic, we use more the domain calculus, where the elements of the tuples are uh, the variables. We will focus on domain calculus. There is an easy translation uh, between the two. So I want to discuss a little bit now Code's technical result, which was that calculus and algebra have the same expressive power. And as I said, calculus, that's the term that he used, but it really stands for first order logic. And indeed, this is the syntax, as we saw it in the early in the morning when Suprati gave the presentation. Uh, this is just the uh, standard syntax of uh, predicate first order logic. And I'm not going to, to repeat it again. And of course, I'll skip the semantics. So Code's idea was that now you can write expressions, formulas of first order logic with three variables, run them on a database, and get back a set of k tuples, which is, consists of all uh, the k tuples in your database that satisfy the formula. So that uh, goes back to the semantics of first order logic that we saw in the morning. 
So as an example, uh, if you have, uh, let's say, an edge relation in a graph, let's say you have connections, E stands from from to non-stop flight, this gives you uh, the pair of nodes that are connected by a path of length two, or the destinations that you can pair, say, B of destinations that you can reach with one stop over, in the case of an airline. And as an illustration of this, we saw how hard we had to work to get the quotient, right? This was uh, a nested application of the difference together with projection selects with Cartesian products. We did all this work really for something very simple because the quotient is easily expressible using the universal quantifier, right? This is the direct translation of a definition of the quotient to first order logic. In this case, the set of all pairs so that for every triple, if uh, x3, x4, x5 belong to s, then the quintuple belongs to r, right? So we get immediately the translation. It's much simpler than the relational algebra expression. This is making a case as to uh, why it's superior to, to have a nice declarative language, okay, as opposed to having a procedural language. So Code's theorem informally says that algebra and calculus have the same expressive power, meaning whatever you can, whatever query you can express one, you can express in the other. As I said, this is not entirely accurate, and I want to explain in the sense in which it's not accurate, and then formulate a rigorous, uh, correct version of this result, and sketch the proof. Going from algebra to calculus is very straightforward. Okay, this is a translation, an interpretation, we're adding an interpreter of going from uh, algebra to calculus. So uh, for every relational algebra expression, there is an equivalent relational calculus expression. There is only one way to do this, and this is induction on the context-free grammar that gives you the relational algebra. Uh, the first three parts are very straightforward. Of course, the union corresponds to the disjunction. You can hardly see it, but there's a disjunction here. The difference is phi and phi one and not phi two. The Cartesian product uh, becomes the conjunction with different uh, with different sets of variables. Uh, what happens to the projection? The projection is existential quantification, right? That's what you would have expected. And the selection well is basically uh, you take your condition and you translate appropriately in first order logic, and then uh, you take the conjunction of the condition uh, theta together with phi, where instead of theta, we're using a translation of theta into the formula of, of calculus. This is very straightforward. So this is a very straightforward translation. Uh, it just brings out the flavor of projection as existential quantification. That's really all there is to it. And the selection as a filter where you add another condition on the, on the formula. What about the converse? Well, it is simply not true. The way we have set up our uh, definition so far, it is simply not true that every relational calculus expression has an equivalent relational algebra expression. Let's see why. Let's take the, this very simple negation of an atomic formula. Okay. We have a problem here. And the problem is that we haven't made explicit our universe. Right? And therefore, here we would like to take the complement or the difference with, with the universe, but we don't have the universe around. We have not made it explicit. So this is really the problem. Remember, in the very beginning, I said there is a little difference between databases and the relational structures. And the difference is not making the universe explicit. Now we pay a price for it. The price is we lose this. Uh, this translation. But that's not the only, this is a blatant way. There are other ways. We have a department uh, and every, in a university. Departments have chairs and we keep track of the administration, keep track of department and the name of the chairs. And we write something like this. X, Y, there is a Z, such that X is the, uh, uh, Z is the chair of department X and Y is different than Z. But what is Y here? We have a problem. And there are other things like that. Uh, we, look, we look for the uh, students 
who enroll in every course in every term. You can also see that there is no way, I mean, this requires proof, but it's, it will, it's not hard to, to show that this is, there is no equivalent relational algebra expression for this one either. So it is not just the negation there, there are other reasons that make this translation fail. So let's take a closer look at this. So as I said, as I hinted, the previous three relational calculus expression are not translatable to algebra because they give different answers depending of, on the domain that we will choose to interpret our variables. Again, the price we pay for not making the universe explicit. So let's look at the simplest of these three examples. Uh, if you see our variables range over a domain D, then of course we can say that the semantics of this expression is D to the K minus R, right? But as we change D, we're going to get different, different values. Uh, intuitively, this means that the relational calculus expression not R is not domain independent. It depends on the domain over which we interpret the variables. So now we want to formalize this notion of domain independence. Uh, on the other hand, something like this, the difference that code used in relational algebra is domain independent. Because you see, when you try to give assign meaning to this expression already, you know that S, this, this tuple must be a tuple in S, right? So even if you consider a bigger domain, it doesn't make a difference. You are still ending up taking the difference between S and R. So we want to capture this difference with a precise definition, this distinction with a precise definition. And this brings the notion, a very important notion in databases called the active domain. The active domain comes in two parts, the active domain of a formula and the active domain of a database. The active domain of a formula is simply the set of all constants that may appear in the formula. So this is a very simple thing. You look at the formula, if it mentions some constants, you put them in the active domain. The active domain of a relational database is really the important thing, is the set of all values that occur in the relations in the database. Okay, so you look at the database, think of it as a set of tables, you look at the individual values, that's the active domain. Now, suppose we have a, a formula of calculus, and now we want to give, remember, we haven't made, we have a database, not a relational structure, so we have no universe around. We want to give rigorous semantics to this. In some sense, the problem is we have not made the semantics very precise. So if I have a domain, a universe, which is big enough to make the evaluation meaningful, and this means it contains the active domain of the formula and the active domain of the database. Then phi sub d of i is the result of evaluating the formula over this domain and i. That is, all the variables and quantifiers are assumed to range over d. It's not meaningful to go below the active domain because then you have to take into account the values that are in the database. And of course, the relation symbols are interpreted by the relation symbols in I. If we take D to be as small as it's meaningfully possible, uh, namely if D happens to be the union of the active domain of phi with the active domain of the database, then we write the result of evaluating phi on D and I as phi active domain of I. And now we can say that a relational calculus formula is domain independent if no matter what domain you evaluate the formula, as long as it's meaningful enough, big enough to be meaningful, what you get is the same as evaluating the formula on the active domain. In other words, all it matters is the evaluation of the active domain. The formula is very stable. Let's look at some examples. Uh, this is not domain independent. We saw that before. We change D, right? We get different answers. We get uh, D to the K minus R. This is not domain independent. Uh, something like this is domain independent. There exists Y, R, X, Y. 
that is easy to see is domain independent. On the other hand, going back to uh, for all y, r, x, y, it's not domain independent. Think about it, because you may have a very simple database in which all you have is r11, right? All you have r11. And then, in this case, uh, the active domain, this is my i. My i consists just of this. The active domain is simply 1, right? So if I evaluate this expression, if I look at all the x's such that for all y, r, x, y, then of course I get only 1, right? But now suppose I change my domain. Suppose I, I, I take my domain as 1, 2. Then if I evaluate, this is, uh, uh, this is let's, say, let's say, this is phi. So I'm evaluating here phi on the active domain. Now if I evaluate phi on this domain, what do I get? I get the empty set, right? I get the empty set. So I've changed the domain and I get a different value because it would insist that also for y equal 2, I must have r12. But I haven't changed my database. I've only changed my domain. So this is not domain independent. Now, with this notion, we can uh, state precisely uh, Code's theorem. So Code's theorem says that if you have a query, the following are equivalent. One, there is a relational algebra expression that gives you the value of the query on every database. Two, you can find a domain-independent relational calculus formula a nice domain-independent relational calculus formula such that q of i is phi on the active domain of i. Remember, the active domain is the set of all values that occur in your database, basically. Third, there is a relational calculus formula. This, you don't know. It may or may not be domain-independent. But you evaluate the query on the active domain only. The, the difference between 2 and 3 is that here you can put a bigger domain and still get the same value because the formula is domain independent, right? In the third, you have an arbitrary formula. You don't know if it is domain independent or not, but you play it safe. You play it safe by restricting your evaluation on the active domain. So let me sketch the proof of this theorem. We have to go 1 implies 2, 2 implies 3, 3 implies 1. It is obvious that 2 implies 3, right? Okay, you use the same formula. So we're going to only worry about 1 implying 2 and 3 implying 1. 1 implies 2, you already proved, in some sense, we have to go back to the previous translation of algebra to calculus and argue in every step that what you get is something which is domain independent. So you have to do it by induction. 2 implies 3, I argue this trivial. So 3 implies 1 has a very important a very simple step, but very important step. The key to this is to go back and realize that the active domain of i is expressible in relational algebra. Okay. That's the first bullet. So that for every relational database schema, there is a relational algebra expression such that for every database, the active domain is the result of evaluating the database, the, the result of evaluating the expression of the database. What was the active domain of the database? The set of all values. Okay? So let's say that we had a relation R with three attributes R, A, B, C. What would be the active domain? What's the expression for the active domain? Well, is remember we have the projection, right? So we can take it as pi. AR union pi BR union pi BC, pi CR, right? This gives us all values that are in the database. Very simple, but very important. And now we use the above facts and induction of the construction to obtain a translation of calculus under the active domain interpretation. And that's now straightforward. Let me, the only interesting part really is universal quantification because, remember, uh, algebra 
doesn't have explicit universal quantification. It has existential quantification and difference, right? So, of course, it used the logical equivalence that for all uh, y psi is not exist y not psi. So, as an illustration, let's look again this uh, this formula which we we had seen is not domain independent. So, what do you do in this case? Well, this is not exist y not r. The active domain is pi 1 r, pi 1 r union pi 2 r. I'm, I'm assuming that r, r, r is binary here. So here is the induction. Under the active domain semantics, not r is the difference between the Cartesian product of the active domain with itself take away r. Therefore, exist y not r is the projection of this expression on the first coordinate. Therefore, not exist y not r uh, is, uh, well, the difference between the active domain take away the previous expression. Okay? So it's very straightforward. And the key to this is that we have restricted the, the interpretation to the active domain and the fact that the active domain is expressible in, uh, in, um, uh, in relational algebra. So the, the bottom line of this is, again, let me look at the result. Let me state the result again, that we have this um, precise statement uh, that gives us the sense in which algebra and calculus have the same expressive power. They don't. What is true is that under the active domain semantics, they have the same expressive power. Or your formula is domain independent, then you don't care about the semantics. Is that clear? Any questions about this? I'm going fast because this is really basic, basic material, but comes out very clean at the end. However, there are some interesting questions. First of all, an observation. Uh, the equivalence is effective. So we can go from algebra to calculus and from calculus to algebra. And therefore, later on, whatever results we prove about, if we prove an indecidability result for the calculus, it translates to algebra and vice versa. So. Uh, so let's go back and think for a moment about the active domain, right? It, it's very nice that we have the active domain, the, the excuse me, domain independent. It's a very nice property to have, but on the face of it, it is a semantic property because we say that for every domain that contains the smallest possible domain uh, possible, we have the same, the same semantics. So we have some bad news if we want to ask the question, can we automate the process of discovering if a calculus expression is domain independent? Because suppose we want to give a programmer the power to write queries in first order logic, right? But then we don't want to have to worry whether or not the formula is domain independent or not and worry about the domain. So there is this old result that preceded Ted Code. He uh, Roberto Di Paola was a logician at UCLA at the time who uh, proved this theorem. He has a three, uh, two page proof using Trachtenberg's theorem uh, that we saw in the morning that determining domain independence is an undecidable problem. There is no algorithm to tell if a given relational calculus expression is domain independent. Not surprising after what we have seen in the morning, right? It's, it's all non-trivial semantic properties concerning first order logic in some sense, they're not to be undecided. However, there is a next best thing you can do in a situation like this. And the next best thing is something that also uh, Anuz would like to have said is uh, effective syntax, right? And effective syntax here means that, this is the good news, you can give a, a nice syntactic description, some context-free grammar for a subclass of first order logic that has the following property. Every formula in this class is domain independent. And vice versa, every domain independent first order formula is logically equivalent to one in your class, right? That's the best thing, the next best thing in the face of the bad news of Roberto Di Paola, right? You can give an effective syntax that in some sense exhausts all of domain independence. Of course, what you cannot discover <laughs> is whether a given formula and the formula in your class are logically equivalent, right? 
all you know there is one. There was a lot of work done on this, and there was a lot of competition to making the class bigger and bigger and bigger in the 80s. There was a lot of work in that direction because the idea was you want to give the programmer the biggest possible class of formulas, right? And uh, something like the top of the line here is this paper by Rodney Topor and Alan Van Gelder. The original paper was in POTS 87. This is the 1992 journal version uh, where they describe such a, a detailed syntax. Uh, anyway, so that's, a, that's an aside. Now, this was the first part I wanted to, as I said, to, to talk about, uh, about what Ted Co did. Now I want to look at three basic, queer, three basic problems about, uh, three basic problems about uh, database query languages. We have seen what a query is. So a query is basically a function that uh, takes as input in the database and gives you back a query relation, and it's invariant under isomorphisms. And of course, all the queries definable in logical languages are queries in this, in this sense. And for us, a Boolean query is going to be a function defined on some database instance that takes value 0, 1, uh, and is also invariant under isomorphisms. So Boolean queries, uh, given a, a, a graph, is a diameter at most 3. Given a graph, is it connected? So we want to look at three basic problems about queries. The query evaluation problem, the query equivalence problem, and the query containment problem. The query evaluation is the most basic problem in databases. You give a query in some language and the database and you want to find the value of the query. We saw this problem in the morning as called the model checking problem. That's the model checking problem for whatever language you have in mind. The query equivalence problem in the case it's simply a version of logical equivalence. You are given two queries and you want to know if uh, on every database they give you the same answer. And of course, this is very important in an actual database management system because the user writes a query and then the optimizer takes the query and transforms it to a query that is presumably easier to evaluate. In the process, you want to be making sure that you work with a sequence of queries that are uh, logically equivalent. The query containment problem is the question given uh, to queries, is it the case that uh, on every database, the relation you get by evaluating the query on the database, the first query is contained in the relation in the second. If the queries happen to be Boolean queries, this is logical implication. So we want to understand what is the algorithmic status of these problems for relational algebra and relational calculus. And uh, already I argued that the query evaluation problem is the main problem in, in query processing. Equivalence and containment are closely related in the sense that uh, two queries are equivalent if one is contained in the other. That's obvious. And also, if our language is closed under conjunction, we have that containment is reducible to equivalence. So. We have seen already the proof in the morning, and I'm grateful for the people that gave the nice introductory lectures in the morning. The query equivalence problem for relational calculus is undecidable, and that's a very easy translation from finite validity. In the morning, we saw it as finite satisfiability, but of course, the fact that there is no algorithm to tell if a first order sentence is satisfiable means also there is no algorithm to tell if a first order sentence is true on all finite structures. That's finite validity. You can very easily reduce finite validity to query equivalence uh, by taking something like uh, a sentence that is finitely valid uh, and then asking uh, whether or not your formula is logically equivalent to this finite valid sentence. So finite validity is reducible to uh, query equivalence. Therefore, we have undecidability. We get for free out of this that the query containment is also undecidable because the query containment uh, is reducible to query equivalence. So the query containment is also undecidable. And of course, notice that here we have a chain of reductions. The halting problem 
goes to finite validity that Trachten brought, finite validity to query equivalence, query equivalence to query containment. So bad news, right? So we have, uh, for, for relational calculus, and algebra, uh, we have one uh, query equivalence and two uh, query containment. Undecidable. Now you can ask what about query evaluation for calculus and algebra and um, the two problems are the same for algebra and calculus because of the polynomial time translation between the two. And we also saw in the morning that both problems are P-space complete. Okay? Because calculus is first order logic. And I had a different sketch of proof here. We saw in the morning in Ram's presentation a very nice uh, proof of the membership in P-space by proving it is in alternating polynomial time, right? Uh, so let me skip the hardness is the quantified Boolean formulas. But you can see also directly that it's in polynomial space. Because if you have such an expression, you bring it in calculus expression, you bring it in prenex normal form. And then you get these quantifiers. Let's say you have m quantifiers. And you create m blocks in memory. And what do you do? In every block in memory, you keep the presentation of the elements of the active domain in binary. Okay, so you need logarithmic many, a constant a logarithmic number of blocks to maintain this, and then you cycle through all possible values. And you also keep a counter in binary to make sure that you have exhausted all the tuples and you have not, don't keep cycling. So this gives you a different way to show that the query evaluation for calculus is in polynomial space. But it also, the same, this argument here, tells you what happens uh, when you fix the formula. Okay? When you fix the formula, the number of quantifiers becomes constant. So you have now m blocks of memory and now again you keep the values in binary and therefore the whole thing becomes in log space right so this is a direct way to see that uh, for fixed formulas the query evaluation problem is in a logarithmic space and therefore it's in polynomial time and in some sense this uh, explains in a way the paradox that we have this high complexity, yet database systems give answers to queries, right? They are not afraid of a P-space complete argument. The reason is typically we have the queries fixed and the database changed, so at least we are in log space in that sense. But uh, in turn, this consideration made Vardy uh, write this influential paper, the complexity of relational query languages, where he introduced these three notions that they will be very important to us as we go forward, the notion of combined complexity, data complexity, and expression complexity. So suppose you have any query language, let's call it L. The combined complexity is the model checking problem where both the formula and the database are part of the input. The data complexity is not one problem, but it's a family of problems. One for every sentence in the language, and it's the question, given a database instance, does it satisfy the formula? The query complexity is where you play the game the other way around. You fix the database. Suppose you have a fixed database in which you ask different questions. So now the formula is, is part of the input only. And of course, you have one such sentence, uh, one such problem uh, for, every, uh, for every database. So, Data complexity is parameterized by the formulas family of problem. Expression complexity is parameterized uh, by the database, the query complexity. And 
you can say what it means for data complex to be in a language, meaning every sentence has the property that the associated decision problem is in the language, is in a complexity class. And the query complexity means is it some complexity class if for every database instance the associated decision problem is in the class. Vardy made an empirical discovery. It's an empirical discovery. It's not something you can prove because you can't go over all possible logics. Uh, that for most query languages, the data complexity is of lower complexity than both the combined complexity and the query complexity, and often exponentially smaller. Okay, that's an empirical evidence. You have to go query language by query language. And quite often, the query complexity can be as hard as the combined complexity. Relational calculus is a case in point here. And that's the picture that we have seen today. For the combined complexity, we saw it is P space complete. Actually, we saw this in the morning. Data complexity, it drops in log space. And so we see the exponential gap between P space and log space. What about query complexity? Well, we know it cannot be worse than combined complexity. So it is in P space. But actually, uh, it can be P space complete. And in fact, we saw this in the morning in Lamb's presentation also. Because he used, he used a, a very simple <laughs> database to encode that has 0, 1, and a unary relation with one element to encode quantified Boolean formula. So this is, this is the situation uh, with calculus and, uh, uh, and, and algebra. So in some sense, this looks like very bad news for databases, right? Because these two problems are undecidable, and a query evaluation in at least combined complexity is p-space complete. Therefore, this motivates the following question that we will explain, and I, I'll go at a lower, slower pace tomorrow. Are there interesting sub-languages of calculus for which these two problems uh, are at least decidable, right? And how low can we go? And uh, by the same token, are there problems, are there languages for which the query evaluation is has lower complexity, at least combined complexity, than, than P space. And how low? How low can, how low can we go? And as we, will turn out, as we will turn out, and that will be the topic of our discussion tomorrow, and we'll tie also with some uh, of the things that I think Ben Rosman will be talking about, uh, there is this language of conjunctive queries, which are simply existential positive sentences built from atomic formulas to existential quantification, no disjunctions. And uh, they have this lower complexity, but the important thing about them from a database point of view is that they encapsulate the most frequently asked questions in databases. So what we're going to do tomorrow is explore these three problems, equivalence, containment, and evaluation for conjunctive queries. And then we'll get some good news and some bad news also. <laughs> And then we'll try to go a little bit beyond them. Uh, so in some sense, here, while before we went outside the first order logic, now we're going inside first order logic and try to see what uh, parts of these problems have more tame behavior than the full algebra and calculus. So I'll stop here. Thank you.